for the wrath. There it is, wrath. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who bow there. Very good, very good, very good. Yes, the wrath of God is a very real thing, and and it's against ungodliness and unrighteousness because they suppress the truth. They don't want to hear the truth. They, they push it away. And so he explains why that's true, because what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. And, and they might say, no, he hasn't. But he's going to say, yes, he has. He's going to explain how in this verse we're looking at today. This is one of the most important verses, I think, for our day in the Bible. It's really, really important. Uh, and it's a longer one, I know. It's kind of hard to get your mind wrapped around a longer one. I see Zach. If you remember some, you've been remembering these pretty well. For his, and if you can't, I understand. This is a long one. This means you can't see it with your eyes. Invisible attributes, namely his. This means forever, eternal power, and this is yeah, divine nature. Wow, Zach, I'm impressed that you keep remembering these things. Divine nature have been clearly. This means understood, recognized seen, perceived, very good, and clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are very good. Zach, I'm so impressed that you remember this. That's good. For his invisible attributes. This is God's. This is why his wrath is revealed. They're suppressing the truth. There's no excuse for it. As far as you see at the end, there's no excuse because his invisible attributes. It's true. You can't see God with your physical eyes, but his eternal power, God's awesome power, and divine nature, the fact that he is God, divine means he's God, his, his holy divine nature, have been clearly perceived or understood or recognized ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made. You can just look at the things that have been made and realize there's a God. <laughs> now, this is amazing. Um, that was true forever i mean men ancient times could look out and and you can look at the birds and you can look at the bugs and insects and you can look at the animals you can look at our bodies and think about our minds and and, and you know look at all this stuff the trees and the plant life all the flowers and everything and you can say this couldn't happen by chance this has to have a creator and so and, and you look at the sky and you see the stars and the, Sun and the moon and the stars, it's just it's amazing. And so even ancient people, David said, when I look at the sky, the work of your hands, you know, the, the heavens speak forth your glory. You know, you, you recognize there, this has to have a creator. People know intuitively everything that came into existence had to have a cause, you know. So this just didn't happen by accident. Now, God knew when he created the world, that that would be true until some people came along like Charles Darwin and others who said, wait a minute, I think I can explain this without God. I think we can leave God out and we can come up with a perfectly good explanation. So we came up with evolution. Now, <laughs> evolution is not as clever as they think it is, but that's all they've got to explain things without God. So I'm going to talk about that in just a little bit. But they, many people who didn't want God, they embraced evolution. They said, this is, this is how we'll explain things. So what did God do? Well, in the 20th century, several decades ago now, God began to raise up men and give them the ability to study the cell on a molecular basis. The molecules of life are incredibly complex. When Darwin came up with his theory of evolution, they thought life was just a little bit of jelly that had the life force in it, and it was just you know, not a big deal. I mean, maybe a big deal, but it was simple. They thought it was very, very simple. And, uh, and he thought maybe in a warm pond somewhere, some of these things got together and started life forms. But when God raised up the molecular biologists, <laughs> it blew them out of the water. Because they began to study the cell, and they realized, man, these, these little, every, every, our, our body is made up of... And I'm going to forget the numbers now, but billions of cells, too small for eyes to see. And every one of those cells has 
up to, you know, not just billions, but trillions and even a quadrillion atoms. And they're all arranged in just exactly the right way to do all these functions. Some of them are formed into proteins. Proteins have thousands of atoms in them. DNA molecules have, have a billion atoms in them. Incredibly complex. It's like a library. And these proteins are like little trucks carrying or, or construction crew mechanisms, <laughs> construction machines where they build other proteins. And, and, it's, it, and all these things are interdependent on each other. They can't function on their own. And these cells are so complex. And these molecular biologists started seeing this stuff. And many of them who were open to God said, there must be a God. One of the most famous atheists of the 20th century was a man named Anthony Flew. He was a, he was a professor at Oxford University in London, which is considered the greatest university in the West. Western Hemisphere and in the world for by most people. And he, uh, he was a philosophy professor and he was an atheist. He wrote books about atheism. He debated Christians on campuses. He, was, he took the atheist side. And when he realized what the molecular biologist had found, he said, I'm done. <laughs> he said, I can't be an atheist anymore. He said, there's obviously a creator. This couldn't, this couldn't exist without a creator. So God's left him without excuse. I mean, and then he lets a cosmologist, these guys that study the universe, Find the fine tuning of the universe. It's amazingly fine tuned. And when they began to understand that, they, they thought this couldn't happen by chance. This has to be engineered. This has to be designed. So, so God, once again, once once people started embracing evolution as an excuse, it was really silly. But they, you know, enough. And 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 and, and nowadays, <laughs> I've, I've told two of my classes this today. I'll go ahead and tell you guys this too. It's it's. Let me finish that sentence. But nowadays. There's even less excuse, but there's still plenty of people out there. They don't want God. So they say, I'm, 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 you know, all the scientists believe evolution. They'll say that. It's not true. But this has been going on now for a while. In the 1960s, I was a kid. I, I, went, to, I went to the University of Tennessee in 1964. I was there from 1964 to 67. And I majored in physics as a science. I did not major in biology or a bio, biological science, but I had to take at least one. I think I may have taken more than one. I don't remember now. Biological sciences. And, and, and what I took was a course called microbiology. And I knew nothing. I was a little kid from Teleco Plains. Uh, God made me pretty smart. I could learn things pretty quickly. But I had never heard all this stuff. I never, I never studied this, never heard it, never knew anything about it. And so when I sat down in that college classroom, I, I got a, there was a guy that was teaching it was working on his Ph.D. You know, sometimes they'll, they'll have doctoral students who are working on their doctor's degrees, but they'll be teaching under undergraduate classes. Uh, I did that for a little while when I was there in Maryland. I, I, I taught physics labs. But anyway, <laughs> he, uh, um, he was very arrogant. He was young. Smart aleck kind of guy. <laughs> and he, his favorite thing was to ridicule Christians. He just did. He, he, he Especially Christians in East Tennessee who he considered backwoods hicks, rednecks, who didn't know any better, who believed in creation and didn't realize that all the scientists believed in evolution. That's what he told us. And, and he would laugh at that every now and then. He'd bring it up again. He likes to talk about it. And so I'm sitting there thinking, man, Okay, I guess all the scientists believe that's what he says. All the scientists believe in evolution. So I came to a conclusion. I thought, well, maybe God did it through evolution. Maybe the way he did it was what the evolutionists say, but God is behind it. They, they call that theistic evolution. So for a few years, I called myself a theistic evolutionist. Wasn't terribly satisfied with it, but I didn't know any better. So I went ahead and finished school. Went to the University of Maryland very briefly. I went up there uh, on a physics fellowship to, to work on uh, uh, a doctor's degree, and uh, didn't stay very long because it's, it's like something. I was I was a Christian, but I really wasn't staying really close to the Lord, and I just got immersed in my physics studies, you know, in college. So I got up there, and I thought, and I began to feel these senses in my heart that I was going in the wrong direction. The Lord's getting my attention, and uh, and I didn't know what to do about it because I never thought about anything else. And so I can remember going out. There was a University of Maryland in a suburb of Washington, D.C. It's called College Park, Maryland. It's the name of the town, but it's, it's really just a suburb of Washington, D.C. A lot of people, a lot of big city stuff. But they had a little park there called Greenbelt Park. And I like to go out there because I'm a, I'm a little mountain boy at the time, you know, and I like to play in the woods and be in the 
around trees and stuff. So I'd go out to the park. And I remember going out there one evening. I don't, probably wouldn't nowadays because it's probably dangerous. But, but at that time, it seemed okay. I went out there, and I remember looking up. And I could see the trees. And I remember saying, Lord, I'm really confused right now. And I don't know what you want me to do. And I'm even not even sure sometimes you're even out there. But if you are, I want, I want you to help me get this straightened out. And I, I remember praying that kind of prayer. Help me straighten my life. It wasn't like I was living in sin. I just wasn't really close to him. And I wasn't. And, and it's like he was changing my direction. And, I, and I, you know, there wasn't a bolt of lightning or anything. And I just went on with that point for a while. But, but it was like that. I look at that as a turning point where God began to work in my heart and say, you're going in the wrong direction, son. You need to go back and start all over. So I prayed about that for a while and finally just decided this is not, I don't want, my future is not in physics. This is not what I'm supposed to do. So I went down to the university and withdrew from the university and went back home. I had been home just a few days and I got a call from a teacher at the high school where I'd gone to high school. And he said, we've had a teacher who had to take a sudden medical retirement right here in the, in the middle of the year. And he said, uh, we heard you were back in town. Would you like to come teach? finish the year I thought well I never thought about that but sure I'll, I'll, I'll do it so I went down and taught and that's the first experience I had teaching I hadn't really planned to do it but it went well I enjoyed it and um, <laughs> it's a funny story this is kind of like chasing a rabbit but at the end of that first year uh, <laughs> these the, things were different in those days politically speaking but uh, I was raised a strong in a strong Democrat family so I was considered a real strong Democrat I didn't I was too young to get too involved in it at the time. I didn't know much about what my politics were, except my family was all Democrat. So uh, <laughs> uh, one day, I, I was, of course, teachers, when you, this is what it used to be, I guess it still is, but you had to teach a few years before you could get what they call tenure. Once you get tenure, it, it, you, you pretty well got a place to teach as long as you want to stay there unless you do something really bad, you know, you, you, you got guaranteed job security. But, but when you first start teaching, you don't have tenure. They want a few years to kind of test you out. So that I didn't have tenure, and some other guys didn't either. And uh, uh, by the way, I said I was raised a Democrat. I really was. But many years ago, the Democratic Party left me behind. When they started embracing abortion, the National Democratic Party now embraces abortion and embraces a sexual revolution and stuff like that. And I think this is not Christian. I can't, I can't be a Democrat. So I quit being a Democrat long ago. I vote Republican most, most all the elections. But... Uh, at that time, I was considered a Democrat. So anyway, uh, the, there was a school board member, and he was responsible for our district there in the county, Teleco district. And he uh, he got up in a school board meeting. He said, we got too many Democrats at Teleco High School. <laughs> I want to get rid of these Democrats. And so they did. They released five of us just because we were Democrats. Or they thought we were Democrats. Uh, they, they said I did a good job, but that I was the wrong political party, so I couldn't stay. And I got bitter about that at first. I thought, that's wrong for them to fire me just because my family's Democrats. <laughs> and the Lord taught me a lesson there, too. He said, son, bitterness is not going to hurt anybody but you. You need to get over that, and you need to forgive those guys. So I remember one, he got me down on my knees, and I said, okay, Lord, my feelings really aren't in this, but I'm choosing to forgive all those men. And when I did, he lifted that bitterness. He went away. So he taught me a lesson there. Meanwhile, McMinn Central picked me up. They didn't care whether it was Democrat or not. <laughs> So they picked me up, and I went over and taught two more years at McMinn Central High School, taught physics and, and, uh, and algebra. And my physics classes, you know, were mainly seniors. There have been some juniors in there. I'm not sure, but anyway, they were really, really sharp kids. And they were asking me questions. And in particular, they were asking me questions about evolution. It didn't have anything to do with physics. They were just curious. And they would ask me, we would have some conversations. They'd ask me about it. And, I, and at the time, I was starting to study the Bible a lot more. I was beginning to really get serious about my growth in the Lord. I was learning how to study the Bible, learning how to memorize scriptures, and I was working on it. And I remember saying, Lord, i got to have some answers. I don't, I don't feel good about this. You know, I'm, I call myself a theistic evolutionist. Help me. Well, at the time, this was long before the Internet. There was no even thought of an Internet back then. I had a... There were some Christian book club companies that would print, print and publish Christian books for anybody who's interested. And they had little catalogs. They were little thin, like magazine like things. And you could flip through those little catalogs, one of those Christian discount book club or something like that. And I'd get that magazine from because I'd order books because I was trying to grow in the Lord. And I was ordering Christian books to help me grow. Well, I got it that day and I opened it up, came in the mail, and I opened it up. And I started flipping the pages and all of a sudden my eyes hit a book. And the name of it was Evolution 
and Christian faith. Evolution and Christian faith. And I look at it, boy, that sounds like what I need. So I ordered it. I didn't know anything about the author. Got the book. Turned out the author was a man named Bolton David Heiser. He was a professor of zoology at Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore, Maryland. Johns Hopkins University is considered one of the most highly esteemed schools of biological science and medical science in the world. They're very, very famous. A lot of doctors go to Johns Hopkins to be trained. Anyway, he was an evolutionist. He was a, he was a zoologist, especially with genetics. And then he wrote this book, and in the introduction he said, I'm basically, I'm just roughly paraphrasing, but he said, I, I wrote this book because as a scientist, he said, I believed evolution all my life, but as I've gotten into it more as a scientist to study it, I realized I cannot be a man of integrity and claim to believe this anymore. I just can't. And he said, I'm going to tell you why in this book. And she did. And boy, it just opened my eyes. I'd never read anything by a really brilliant scientist who was rejecting the theory of evolution. Now, since then, there are many, many more I've read, you know, but, but he was the first one. And boy, it just, it just, wow, I thought this is incredible. And he changed my mind completely. So I, I, I jettisoned the theory of evolution. I thought this is, this is for people who don't want God. Now, they've been so effective at persuading people that evolution is what all the scientists teach, which is not true. There are many brilliant scientists who are not evolutionists, but that's what they say. A few years later after that, I was at Southwestern Seminary, and I took a philosophy of religion course there. And in that course, I think there were 13 of us in there. And of the 13 of us, only two had any kind of science background. I did. And one other guy did. And we and, and one day the professor said, I'm just curious, guys. He said, I don't care what you believe. I'm just curious. How many of you believe that God created things through evolution, which is what I had believed earlier? And 10 of those guys raised their hands. Three of us did not. Of the three of us who did not, two of us were the science guys. And we'd both kind of gone through the same thing. Because of our science background, we'd gotten kind of into a situation where we had to study a little more seriously. And when we did, we thought, no, this is not right. You know, so we rejected it. And I thought, why did the other ten raise their hands? They didn't have science backgrounds. They didn't know the science. They raised their hands because they had been told, well, all the scientists believe this. This is just what all educated people believe. And so they thought, well, I guess that's what we got to believe. But they hadn't really studied it. So now more and more scientists are beginning to give it up. However, it's still common for scientists who don't want God, no one except God, to say, oh, all the scientists, all the scientists are evolutionists. All the scientists recognize evolution. So God raised up these molecular biologists to come along and say, look, let's show you what, what this is. And now you re we realize, wow, this just couldn't have happened by chance. So Anthony Flew, the famous atheist, changed his mind and uh, started recognizing that God had to be the creator. So anyway, when you study it closely, uh, it's pretty awesome what God's done. He's, a, he's an awesome artist. You look at things, you look at the beauty of the universe, the beauty of the creation, blows you away. He's an incredible artist. The engineering is just is mind-boggling. It's so incredibly complex, we can't begin to understand it. Uh, he's a genius. <laughs> of course, he's God. He's powerful. He's wise. He's, and, so, and so he says, the, the, his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made, and now more clearly than ever. So they're without excuse. They don't have an excuse. They're going to have to suffer the wrath of God because they simply refuse to see the truth. They don't want to see it. Okay. Let's see if we can memorize it. For his invisible attributes, I know this is long. I'll help you with it. For his invisible attributes, for his invisible attributes, for his invisible attributes, namely, these are his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made. So they're without excuse. I know that's a lot. I'll help you. Can you get started? Because wow. That's awesome, Zach, that you can get that far. I'm impressed. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived in the things that have been. Remember the word in the things that have been. Yeah, made. Uh -huh. Oh, I forgot that myself. I left out a phrase right there. Ever since the creation of the world, I'm sorry. I left out a phrase myself. Have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world. 
Now it's endless things that have been made. So, remember how it ends? There without excuse. Thank you, Zach. Yeah, yeah, I looked at it ever since the creation of the world. Okay, it's a long verse. It's a great verse. If we didn't already have a theme verse in Veritas, Warriors of Christ, which is First Peter 3.15, I would say this would be a great, great theme verse for us. Okay. Well, I talked a long time there. Anything you want to add or say or talk about or pray about? Glad you pray. Father, thank you for these kids. Thank you for their patience. Thank you for their listening ears. Thank you for their attention and their desire to learn more about you. And I pray that you'd help them to internalize a lot of these things. Lord, I know sometimes I cover away so much that it's hard to absorb. But uh, thank you that they're working at it. And thank you for giving us this verse today, Lord. Thank you that, uh, that your invisible attributes, namely your eternal power and divine nature, Lord, we can perceive it very clearly in the things that you've made. Lord, uh, you're, you're awesome. You've created so much beautiful things, so many complex things. The way you put together life with all the molecules of life, Lord, it just blows our minds. We cannot begin to wrap our brains around it. The way you fine-tune the universe for life just makes us amazed and, and awed at you, Lord. You're an awesome creator. So help us never to lose that sense of amazement and awe and appreciation of your glory and your creative genius and your artistry and your engineering skill, Lord. You're awesome in all your ways. We want to praise you well and recognize it. And Lord, we certainly realize that those who reject you, in spite of this evidence, has been clear ever since the creation of the world, the things that have been made. Lord, they're fools. We know they're fools, and yet they're, it's sad to watch them make such a foolish decision and try to reject you and try to ignore you and try to suppress the truth about you. Lord, it's so sad, and we pray that we will be not, we won't fall into those traps, but that we will have answers to the questions when people ask us why we believe what we believe. So, Lord, thank you for giving us all this evidence. Thank you for showing yourself clearly and powerfully in your creation. As we continue to work through the men and women of the Bible and your book, we pray, Lord, that you'd teach us what we need to learn. And help us to go stronger in Jesus and learn the lessons you want us to learn from these uh, powerful accounts of the way you worked through men and women in the past. So thank you for your word. Thank you for this time we have together. In Jesus' name, amen. So I dropped the cap. I can. Although it's harder than you think for an old man to get over and pick up the cap, you know. <laughs> yes. All right. Let's see. All right, we're going to pick up with Naomi and Ruth. This is a fabulous story. I may have it all here. I don't know for sure. It's not, it's not a very long book. It's a short little book, but it's such a beautiful story. And I'm going to work, work our way through it. He tells us when this happened in the days when the judges ruled. Most people think Samuel probably wrote this account down about Naomi and Ruth. He would have known all about it. No doubt about that. Um, in the days when the judges ruled, so this may have been like during the period of Samson, or maybe even Samuel himself, eh, probably before Samuel. There was a famine in the land. So famine, of course, means what? Starving. Yeah, they're starving. There's not, they're, they're, not, they're not having good crops. Probably because it had been a dry season, they hadn't been able to reap heart, harvest the crops, and, and they're, they're, not, they're hungry. So a man of Bethlehem, interesting. You know about Bethlehem. You know, later on, it's going to be where Jesus comes from, he was born. A man of Bethlehem in Judah went to sojourn in the country of Moab. Now, that's outside of Israel. That's a country kind of to the east of Israel, Moab, across the Jordan River. So he took he and his wife and his two sons. So he's got a, it's a man and his wife and their two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech. The name of his wife was Naomi. And the names of his two sons were Malon and Kilion. They were Ephrathites. From Bethlehem. Bethlehem was also called Ephratha. It's a different town. They're two, no, it's the same town. They're two different names, different names. So they're called Ephrathites because they're from the town of Ephratha or Bethlehem in Judah. 
they went into the country of Moab, out of Israel, which is not exactly where God wanted them to go, but they were starving, so they thought, we got to do something. And they remained there. But Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died. So the, the, the husband and the head of the family dies. She was left with her two sons. These took Moabite wives. They were living down in the area of Moab, so they took Moabite wives. That, again, was not what God wanted people to do in those days. He wanted them to marry other Israelites, but they married Moabite wives. That's just what they did. The name of the one was Orpah, and the name of the other was Ruth. They lived there about 10 years, and both Malin and Kilion died, so that the woman was left without her two sons and her husband. So now her husband's died, her two sons have died, but she's got two daughters-in-law, women that these sons have married. So now we've got Naomi and Orpah and Ruth. And my clicker's not working. Then she arose with her daughters-in-law to return from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the fields of Moab that the Lord had visited his people and given them food. So that's the Hebrews, and this is good thinking, but a lot of times in the Hebrew, uh, they would just say God did it, and God did do it. He probably said rain so they could grow the crops, and so the crops are growing again, there's food again there. So the Lord's visited his people and given them food. So she set out from the place where she was with her two daughters and all, and they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. She thought, I'm going home. I don't have any husband here. I don't have any sons here. That meant nobody to take care of her. Her husband would take care of her. But why? If the husband died, the sons would take care of her. But there was nobody to take care of her. And, and, and so she thought, I'm going to go back home to maybe some of my relatives. But Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, both Ruth and, and Orpah, she told him, go, return each of you to her mother's house. Just go back home, back to where you were raised, and may the Lord deal kindly with you as you dealt with the dead and with me. So they've been good daughters-in-law. And she said, you've been good daughters-in-law, but you don't need to go with me. Just go on back home. The Lord grant that you may find rest, each of you in the house of her husband. So she assumes they're going to remarry now. Their husbands are dead, so they'll just go back home and find them more by husbands is what she's assuming. Then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voices and wept. So there's a, there's a close relationship here between these three women. And they said to her, no, we'll return with you to your people. They feel closer to Naomi now than they did their own mother at this point. That's not unusual either. My wife, once we got married and moved to Tennessee, she felt a lot closer to my mom than she did her own mother. But Naomi said, turn back, my daughters. Why would you go with me? Have I yet sons in my womb that they may become your husbands? You're not going to get any more husbands out of me. <laughs> I'm too old, and, and you're too old for me to raise kids for them to marry. You, know, you might as well go back and find another husband. Turn back, my daughters. Go your way, for I'm too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, even if I should have a husband this night and should bear sons, would you therefore wait till they were grown? Would you therefore refrain from marrying? No, my daughters. For it's exceedingly bitter to me for your sake that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. So she feels like God's kind of turned against her because her husband's died and her sons have died. But God's got a plan. She just can't see it yet. Then they lifted up their voices and wept again. And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, mother but, which means Orpah kissed her goodbye. That's what that means. But Ruth clung to her. Ruth's just not going to let go. And she said, see, this is, this is Naomi talking. To Ruth, see your sister in law Orpah has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister in law. But Ruth said, Do not urge me to leave you or to return from following you. For where this, this makes me weep every time I read it. You've heard it at weddings, probably. For where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God my God. This is her statement of faith. She's, she's becoming a follower of the true God. And uh, have you ever heard, I don't know if you've ever heard that at weddings or not, but they used to have that verse at weddings a lot, which it, this is this is Ruth telling her mother-in-law, where you go, I will go. But it's a wonderful thing for a husband or wife to tell each other. You can see that, you know, where you go, I will go, where you lodge, I will lodge, your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. It's a beautiful statement of commitment. So Ruth, is, Ruth becomes a, a, a lover of God at this point, a follower of the true God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. I'm not going back to Moab. I'm done with Moab. I'm going to follow the true God. 
May the Lord, the true God, do so to me and more also of anything but death parts me from you. I'm going to stay with you, Ruth, I'm Naomi. I'm not leaving. And when Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more. So the two of them went on until they came to Bethlehem. So they come back now to their ancient home. It's been many, many years since she's been there. But there's, there are people that remember them and remember Naomi. When they came to Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And the women said, is this Naomi? <laughs> Naomi's back. You know, after all these years, Naomi's back. Now, Naomi had a relative of her husband, a worthy man of the clan of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. Now, he's another main character in this account. Boaz, he's a close relative. And Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, let me go into the field and glean among the ears of grain after him in whose sight I shall find favor. Now, let me explain that. God told the Israelites, when you plant food, when you plant your grain, uh, if, if don't, don't reap all the harvest. Say, let some of it go. You know, reap most of it. You plant it. You can reap it. But let some of it be at the edges of the field and in the field. Let leave some of it so the poor people can come through and pick it up. They had to work for it. He didn't say take it home and give it to the poor people. He said let the poor people come out and work. But they can come out and gather some of the strain that you leave, leave behind for them. And so women who didn't have husbands uh, to take care of them would be counted part of the poor people. And so she's going out there as a poverty-stricken woman to glean to try to get some food. And she said to her, Naomi said to her, go, my daughter, go ahead. We need food, so go ahead and glean fields. That just meant go out when they're reaping and walk behind them and get what, what's left over. So she set out and went and gleaned in the field after the reapers. And she happened to come to the part of the field belonging to Boaz. It was the clan of Elimelech. So he's a, he's a distant relative, but he's part of that family. And behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem. And he said to the reapers, the Lord be with you. Now, what, what, what God's telling us here is Boaz is a godly man. He's, he's, he's greeting his reapers graciously. They're his servants. They're working for him. But he's, he, he's praying that the Lord take care of him. The Lord be with you. It's a greeting. And they answered, the Lord bless you. So they, res they responded to him. He had a good relationship with his servants. It's a good sign. Then Boaz said to his young man who was in charge of the reapers, whose young woman is this? Ruth had already gotten his attention. <coughs> and the servant who was in charge of the reapers answered, she's the young Moabite woman who came back with Naomi from the country of Moab. They knew who she was. They didn't know her name, but she knew, they knew she was a Moabite woman. <coughs> uh, <coughs> she said, please let me glean. They've heard the story of what Ruth has done. She said, please let me glean and gather among the sheaves after the reapers. So she came. And she's continued from early morning until now, except for a short rest. So she's a hard worker. She's been working all day, picking up some grain so that she can take it back to Naomi. Then Boaz said to Ruth, so he went to her and said, listen, my daughter, don't go to glean in another field or leave this one. Keep close to my young women. There were several young women out there uh, doing the same thing. He said, stay here because I'm not going to hurt you. And if you go somewhere else, you might get in trouble. So just stay here in my field and I'll, I'll protect you. Let your eyes be on the field that they're reaping <coughs> and go after them. Have not I charged the young men not to touch you? So he told his, his servants, leave that girl alone. Don't bother her. When you're thirsty, go to the vessels and drink what the young men have drawn. <coughs> so he's showing her favor. He's, he's trying to bless her. Then she fell on her face, bowing to the ground and said to him, why have I found favor in your eyes that you should take notice of me since I'm a foreigner? I'm not even an Israelite, even though I'm recognized your God, and I'm committed to stay here and worship your God, but I'm a Moabite. But Boaz answered her, all that you've done for your mother-in-law, he had heard what she had done for Naomi. Since the death of your husband, she's been taking care of Naomi, has been fully told to me, and how you left your father and mother and your native land and come to a people that you did not know before. The Lord repay you for what you've done, and a full reward be given you. So he realizes she sacrificed, she's left her home, She's, she's identifying with Israel now and uh, worshiping the true God. And she's taking care of Naomi, her mother-in-law. And he wants, he's, he's impressed with that. That's, that's a, she's been done a really wonderful thing. Whoops. Sort of twice. That's a, I'm sorry, I hit that in there twice. I didn't realize that. 
the Lord repay you for what you've done, and a full reward be given you by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you come to take refuge. I didn't have that line on there. I guess that's why I split it up. And I didn't realize I didn't take the other one off. But, so, so it's it's like God. The, the Bible has this picture more than once. It's like God's taking care of people. And it's like, I've, I've got you under my wings. <laughs> so I'm going to protect you. I'm going to take care of you. Jesus said that when he went to Jerusalem, right before he died. He said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how I've longed to, to, to bring you and take care of you like a hen gathers her chicks. And you would, you just wouldn't let me take care of you. I wanted to. And so he's saying, God has brought you under his wings and you've taken refuge under the true God of Israel. I'm praying God will protect you. So that, there was a really good meeting there. Uh, so, so Naomi hears about it and Naomi her mother-in-law said to her my daughter should I not seek rest for you that it may be well with you is not Boaz our relative with whose young women you were see he's winnowing barley down to the threshing floor I've obviously let's see hold on a minute I, I must have skipped some of it I don't know anyway we'll keep reading um, so, she's, so Naomi finds out what's happened she knows that Boaz is a single relative. He's in that family. And so he's he's eligible to take her for a wife. And she's beginning to, her wheels are going, this this guy would be a good husband for you, Ruth. So she said, he's winnowing barley tonight at the threshing floor. Wash therefore and anoint yourself. Clean up. Put on your cloak. Go down to the threshing floor. But don't make yourself known to the man until he's finished eating and drinking. So just wait. So he finishes eating and drinking. But when he lies down, observe the place where he lies. So just be there in the group and watch. And go and cover his feet and lie down, and he will tell you what to do. Now, that sounds a little bit risky. Oh, my goodness, why would you do that? But she knows what kind of man he is, and she knows this is a symbolic of her willing to be a servant for him and willing to uh, let him be in charge of her and asking for his help. They're not doing anything immoral here. And she replied, all that you say, I will do. So she went and lay down on the threshing floor and did just as her mother-in-law had commanded her. And when Boaz had eaten and drunk, his heart was merry. He went to lie down at the end of the heap of grain. She came softly and uncovered his feet and lay down. At midnight, the man was startled and turned over. And behold, a woman lay at his feet. He said, who are you? And she answered, I am Ruth, your servant. Look at this. Spread your wings over your servant, for you are a redeemer. So she's, he's talking about God spreading his wings over her. Now she said, would you do that for me? Would, would you be willing, you're, you're a redeemer, a kinsman redeemer with somebody in the family that could that could marry this widow and take care of her and raise children in the name of the dead husband. Are you are you still okay, Matthew? You wait. And, uh, and so he, he said, she said, you're eligible and I'm eligible. You could be my husband and I could be your wife. That's what she's saying. She's saying, would you marry me? She's, she's making a proposal here. And he said, because he can redeem her. And he said, may you be blessed by the Lord, my daughter. You've made this last kindness greater than the first. And she's not gone after the young men, whether poor or rich. And now, my daughter, do not fear. I will do for you all that you ask. For my fellow townsmen know that you're a worthy woman. Now that it's true that I'm a, that's true, I'm a redeemer. Yet there is a redeemer nearer than I. There's somebody in the family that, that has the right to marry you first if he's willing to. That's what he's saying there. So the mystery kind of grows here we think oh no uh, this is not seeming to work out there's somebody else so boaz got went to the gate and sat down there and behold the redeemer whom boaz had spoken came by when he had mentioned to boaz said turn aside friend sit down here and he turned aside and sat down and he took 10 men of the elders of the city and said sit down here so they sat down so he's getting the men of the elders of the city important men and he wants to talk to him. So they've got, he's got this man who's the other redeemer, the closer redeemer. He said, we're going to talk. And he said to the redeemer, Naomi, who's come back from the country of Moab, selling the parcel of land that belonged to our relative Elimelech. So I thought I'd tell you of it and say, buy it in the presence of those sitting here, in the presence of the elders of my people. If you'll redeem it, redeem it. But if you'll not, tell me that I may know. For there's no one besides you to redeem it. And I come after you. So he's saying, look, all right, there's some land here. And you can buy it if you want to, because you're the next of kin, next of kin. But he said, let me know if you don't want it, because I can buy it, because I'm after you. And he said, I will redeem it. And we think, oh, no, <laughs> we want Ruth and Boaz to be together here. And then Boaz said, by the way, you need to know this, 
the day you buy the field from the hand of Naomi, you also acquire a wife, <laughs> Ruth the Moabite, the widow of the dead, in order to perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance. That was the rules of the time. If they took that in, in land, they had to take her too. And the Redeemer said, I can't do it then, lest I impair my own inheritance. That may mean he knew that uh, his own kids would get would suffer here because some of his money and inheritance would go to other people, that you know, the children of Ruth or whatever, of Ruth, and, and he said, I, 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 I'm not going to do that. That's going to mess up my own family. So take my right of redemption yourself or I can't redeem it. So Boaz said to the elders and all the people, your witnesses this day that I bought from the hand of Naomi all that belonged to Elimelech and all that belonged to Kilion and to Malin. Also Ruth the Moabite, the widow of Malin, I bought to be my wife to perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance, that the name of the dead may not be cut off among his brothers and from the gate of his native place. That was just the way they did it. That was the tradition. You're witnesses this day. All the people were at the gate, and the elders said, We are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who's coming into your house like Rachel and Leah. In other words, may you have kids who together built up the house of Israel. May you act worthily in Ephrathah and be renowned in Bethlehem. May your house be like the house of Perez and Tamar, born to Judah, because the offspring that the Lord will give you by this young woman. So they said, may you, they're just asking a blessing. God, may God bless this marriage. We want you to have a bunch of kids. So Boaz, Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife. And he went into her, and the Lord gave her conception. She bore a son. Is that mine? Okay, can you turn it on? So, so Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife. He went into her, and the Lord gave her conception. She bore a son. Then the woman said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord. To Naomi, Blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without a Redeemer. Boaz has turned out to be a Redeemer. And may his name be renowned in Israel. He shall be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age. She's going to have some kids. And you're, for your daughter-in-law who loves you, Ruth loves you, who is more to you than seven sons, she's really been valuable to Naomi, more than seven sons, has given birth to him. Then Naomi took the child, laid him on her lap, this is her grandson, and became his nurse. And the women of the neighborhood gave him a name, saying, A son has been born to Naomi. They named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. So King David's dad was named Jesse. Jesse's dad was named Obed, and Obed was the son of Ruth. So he's like this, this baby that Ruth has, Ruth and Boaz, becomes the grandfather of King David. And they, and they become in the line of the Messiah. They're, they're, the God uses them to bring about the Messiah eventually. So it's a beautiful story. And uh, I, I read the highlights of the whole story here. You might want to take your Bible and just read those four chapters yourself sometimes. It's really, especially in a translation, it's easy to read. And just read it through because it's really an exciting Bible story. And it features mainly women, you know, Ruth and Naomi. And of, course, or, of course, Boaz is important too, but you know, but. Pretty exciting story. Most people think of it as one of the beautiful love stories in the Bible. Okay. Anything you want to add or say? Talk about before I let you go. No? Very good. Father, bless these kids. Give them a good evening. Help us all to make good decisions the rest of this day and the rest of this week and bring us safely back on Thursday. We want to be good servants of yours. We want to be followers. We want to be loving you the way you love us. Lord, we know we can't do that really, but we want to try. We want to love you more and more. Teach us how to do that. Teach us how to walk with you. Teach us how to listen to you to bring you glory and honor and praise and thanksgiving. Thank you, Lord, for all your blessings. You're so good to us. Thank you for this incredible account that you put into your word about Ruth and Naomi, Boaz, and little Obed, who became the grandfather of King David and became in the line uh, for the Messiah. So thank you, Lord, for the way you set it all up. You're amazing in everything you do. We love you, we praise you, we, and all of you, and we thank you for your loving us. In Jesus' name, amen.